1977, the outbreak of the war is kind of regarded to be about 1983 when the anti-Tamil pogroms started. Um, so you're pretty young at this stage, you're six years of age. At what stage did you get a sense that you're living in a in an unusual country in the sense yeah, of the well, civil war? And it's, it's, it's a strange thing. I remember from a young age, my father had a lot of friends. Some of them were uh, in politics. Um, a lot of them were in, 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 in uh, a few of them were uh, very vociferous members of the socialist uh, part of the, uh, the, 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 the party at that time. And uh, there used to be huge discussions and debates and fights even sometimes. On, it's on, quite a political household. Yes, in the sense, not in the sense of taking sides, but in the sense of talking about the status quo and what's going on, what's happening. So. As a young kid, you don't take a lot in, but you, you, you listen to these conversations happening. And your father took some Tamils in at one stage, didn't I think you? When, when the riots started, I remember the riots as being, for a six-year-old kid, a happy time because <laughs> my, it, it is ironic because from a six-year-old kid's point of view, I had all my friends at home. Suddenly, friends who would come on a weekend, because they are every day with me for a month or maybe a little bit because longer. school's out. You the mean, school's yeah. out, but... What I didn't realize, they were all my friends who were from a Tamil background, who my parents had taken in to ensure that they had a safe place to stay. But I don't understand this. I see football, I see cricket, mm -hmm. we play on, you know, in, the, in the front yard of our house. Everyone's, all the kids are having fun, the parents are having a chat, of course. But suddenly, at what stage then did but the, suddenly the changes. But suddenly start. my parents would come and say, listen, everyone's got to go in the house. Everyone's got to go in the house. So everyone goes in and you know, later on I understand that they were talking about, okay, which cupboards do we, you know, use to mm -hmm. kind of Hide push people, people into if, 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 but maybe because of my father's stature in the town or what, I don't know, no one really came to our house. Uh, but I remember going to my father and I mentioned this in my Cowdery lecture and I asked my father, oh, I hope this happens every year, it's so <laughs> great. And my father just looked at me, didn't say anything. And you had a coach, I think, who yes, later on... Who I had a coach then, during the, the JVP court. insurgency in the, in the late 80s. Uh, D.H. De Silva, he was a, uh, a national cricketer, um, a wonderful man. Uh, and he got me into tennis when I was seven years old. And my sister into tennis when she was like, what, a year and a half, two years later. And I remember we were just leaving the house to walk down to the tennis courts because it was about a 10 to 12 minute walk from our house. When we got a call saying he had been shot on the tennis court, so it was a shocking thing. It turns out that two uh, people on the motorbike had come, opened fire, hit him, I think, twice in the stomach. A stray bullet hit um, a girl by the name of Thasmin uh, Amon, who was a friend of ours, had hit her in the knee. Um, they put the gun to his head and pulled mm. the trigger, but the gun jammed. So that was how lucky he was. And, he was quite a large gentleman with a kind of a little bit of padding on yeah, his stomach. Yeah. So I think that may have been the only reason why he was saved because he survived the two uh, gunshot injuries. We visited him in hospital. And then he went, um, he went to Melbourne and he never came back until I invited him to come back and watch the 2011 World Cup. Those were kind of memories and times that kind of give you perspective on life, mm -hmm. which later on when you look back, um, you understand that it was so unusual and sometimes, unfortunately, you can get desensitized and think that it's normal. But I think even from that, my parents at all times pointed out that this is not how life is supposed to be, that this is not what it is. There is a better way to do things. Uh, if you take the cricket team, the cricket team was a great example of how a Sri Lankan society could be. We had mm -hmm. uh, Russell Arnold, uh, Murli Dharan, Ravinder Pushpakumar, all from Tamil backgrounds. Um, we had Jahan Mubarak, who was Muslim, Fawiz Maruf, who was, who was Muslim. Then we had, uh, um, you know, Christians, we had Buddhists, we had uh, everyone who was, uh, we had Michael Van Dott, who's a, who's a, who's a burger. Uh, Hence your, I think your closing line in the Cowdery Lecture, I am Tamil, Sinhalese, Muslim burger. I am Tamil, I am Sinhalese, I am Muslim and burger. I am a Buddhist. I'm a Hindu, a follower of Islam and Christianity. But above all, today and always, I will be proudly Sri Lankan.
Thank you. So you see the cricket team very much as an ex exemplar of how society could be. That is absolutely the case. And there was no division in that side on ethnicity or religion. And these are unfortunately divisions that you encounter in larger society due to various issues from colonization to um, uh, parliamentary representation to, uh, to constitutional issues to um, social conditioning and of course at the end of divisive politics. But the larger society in Sri Lanka fighting to unite about a minority of politicians, of people, ignorant masses uh, fighting to, of course, sow discord. The uniting part, of course, is going to be a complicated one now since the end of the war, but this is the absolute right time to explore every avenue to ensure that there is a Sri Lankan identity built. Now you go and see that and you understand that it'll take a couple of generations, maybe another generation for the wounds maybe to heal or a new hope, a new society to start to build with the children because I think the older generation have too many scars, um, too much fear, too much ignorance um, to fully integrate. Look at my children. I hope they spend their lives in Sri Lanka, mm. um, not leave and go away for opportunities abroad, but stay there and actually live in the country that we know that Sri Lanka could be. You mentioned devastation, destruction, um, the wider perspective that you have. I mean, a lot of cricketers just look at confines of the dressing room, the next things, the averages. You've clearly got a broader perspective on life. But, and the war may have been one reason for that. Two other events, I, I suspect, had a profound uh, effect on you. The first, the tsunami uh, in Sri Lanka. You were in New Zealand with the team um, on December the 26, 2004. What are your memories of that morning? Well, I think we were playing, uh, was it in Christchurch, I think, or Auckland? Um, we just got thrashed by New Zealand and just walked into the dressing room dejected. Um, and then, of course, Sana Jaisuria, who's the most connected man in, in, in our team, he has about two or three telephones on, on every tour, <laughs> and he gets calls from you know various news agencies, from all his friends. Ever. Suddenly he said, oh, you know, there's been a, some flooding in Sri Lanka. Somebody said some waves from the sea. And you're like, oh, floods happen in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. it's nothing new. So we really did. Then it slowly started, you know, more information got was seeping through. I think, okay, it's a, a tidal wave, it's a tsunami. We're like, okay. Yeah, okay, the big waves. Maybe did you know what houses. tsunami was at we, this we, point? I, 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 I knew I what a tsunami it, was because I, we studied the, mm -hmm. it, it at school. Uh, Japan was always famous for having, uh, you know, uh, having had tsunamis in the past. It is not something we've discussed every day, of course, no, in, no. in everyday conversation. But um, so we went back to the hotel, and then slowly we had phone calls coming in and all of that, and we switched on the TV. And what we thought was a wave, you kind of dismiss it, right? What damage really could a wave do, right? What, wash away a house? And then suddenly you see this, you see gold underwater, you see people being swept away, live footage, that was, well, in the sense, recorded footage. Um, and it's, it's hard to fathom, you still don't want to believe it, you think that this is not possible, is this? And then it sinks in, then I remember the next day my wife was there as well, there were talks about the tour going ahead or not, and I don't think any one of us was in a frame of mind to play. All of us wanted to go back. So I remember coming back and landing in Colombo on New Year's Eve, I think it was. And New Year's Eve is, is, is the most festive time of the year in Colombo. And everyone's out. Either they're having a party, going out for dinner, out with their families, or at various hotels with a New Year's Eve parties. And I remember landing in, and the entire day Colombo, not many lights on, was no one on the street, dead quiet. And you go through this and thinking, oh, okay, yeah, you land in, and it's this eerie emptiness to see everyone's just got involved in, in relief work. Everyone's mm -hmm. gone, everyone's gone collecting rations, supplies, gone to devastated areas to help out, to be of service. It really started hitting us, the devastation, when Murali, myself, Mahela, uh, my wife at the time, a few of our friends, we went with the World Food Program 
went out with the, uh, with the foundation of goodness at that time. It was just a very rudimentary organization mm -hmm. at the time. And out and visited refugee uh, 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 camps, refugees from the tsunami. We went to LTD, all these areas. And you, you hear these stories, you see these people absolutely empty in their eyes. And, you know, you meet a father who's lost three of his children and his wife and left with one child. Um, you see, you know, the mother left alone with no one there. You see children left alone with her parents. You see entire families wiped out and no one to say whether they lived or died. We go to the first camp, they all throng around us and the first thing they ask us is, how is Sanat Jaisuru's mother and Upul Chandana's mother? And you, 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 mm -hmm. you almost feel, you know, how can this be that their first thought is for someone mm -hmm. else rather than the plight they're in? And it's, it's amazing you see that and it really drives home in a country like Sri Lanka where cricket has, in, especially in our darkest times, been more than a sport, been actually kind of a, not just escape is, but also, also almost like a, a return to normal life mm -hmm. when cricket is being played. That you have so much more responsibility beyond the cricketing field to your fellow man and in, 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 in your society in Sri Lanka. And this drives it home every single time. And these are lessons I think none of us who, who, who's involved on the ground in Sri Lanka would ever, ever forget. Of course, we had Lahore after that. Well, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, that's the other defining I think, event in some I ways. think what we, what we saw on the ground during the tsunami and we, what we've seen then in society, in, in the war zones, all of these things, I think it allowed us to put Lahore in pers into perspective. What are your memories of that particular morning, March the 3rd, 2009? <laughs> it, is a, it is a funny thing. It is, you were sat right next to Tilan. Samarawira on the Yes, coach. yes. It was, a, it was a tour organized by the then interim committee chairman, Arjuna Ranatunga. For some reason, um, tour Pakistan uh, at a time when all the countries were not going and security was an issue. And we had written to him on our concerns with security and, and of course, exploring insurance for the players if something did happen. And which were also very, very politely refused and then said that, yes, we had done all the groundwork to ensure security. So we went, as usual, you know, there's usual banter in the bus. People talk about what are you going to do this evening? What are we doing? One of our fast bowlers sitting in the front says, you know, the wickets are so bloody flat. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to get a stress fracture or something. I hope a bomb goes off so we can go home. And 20 seconds later, this happens. So, um, and it's just, I think, Lal Thamel, who was a uh, monsieur at the time, was in the front. We only heard the gunshots. We thought it was firecrackers. He, he got up and said, get down the shoot in the bus. And I think Dilshan was also in the front. I was most central. Uh, Mahal always sits right at the back. Murli sits right behind me, uh, just so that he can annoy Tilan Samravira from sitting behind him. And then I remember Taranga Parnavitana, the opener on his debut tour, I think, was seated in front. Um, um, and uh, all hell broke loose, really. We hit, the, we hit the aisle of the bus, everyone on top of each other, really. And then the shooting started and just, they just, you know, shot the bus as many mm -hmm. times as they mm -hmm. could through grenades and fired a rocket launch, all of this. And for some reason, I don't know why, we all survived. Tilano's was injured. I got hit in the shoulder with a lot of shrapnel. Ajanta Mendes was injured. Taranga Parnavitana gets up, bleeding from his chest and collapses, saying, He's been shot. We hear oohs and ahs from all over the bus. Paul Fabres has, a, has an iron spike uh, through his hand. So we get into, into the ground, which is only 500 meters from this Liberty Roundabout. Mm -hmm. um, then very rudimentary security, of course, but, and, and, and unfortunately, most of the security personnel who were guarding us died, and that was tragic. The bus driver, they tried to shoot him, missed him, I think, about a couple of inches. And that he probably, was the hero of the hour. Yes, because the that's end. probably why we survived, that he was left alive to drive us mm -hmm. through that. So he, and every day he takes about four attempts to get into this ground through this narrow gate. And this time, he just one perfect take straight into the ground. <laughs> uh, and then um, we get off. Taranga Panritana, for some reason, we, we thought he had died, gets up and feels his back and says, there's no hole in my back, so I think I'm okay, and walks off the pass. Tilan gets carried out, bleeding everywhere. He's been shot very badly. He gets taken by ambulance to, to hospital. Ajanta Mendes and I went due to get in the next ambulance to go when they were shooting next to the ambulance. We thought, listen, uh, we, we'd, we'd stay here. So then, of course, 
being us, being Sri Lankan, 10 minutes into this, suddenly there's a little joke from one side, another from that end, a little bit of laugh, then suddenly it kind of, everyone starts breathing, talking, chatting. But at no, at no time did we ever feel sorry for ourselves. Mm. We didn't get together in a huddle and say, oh my God, why us? Uh, there's, I think a lot of the talk was about uh, just surprise that, you know, we've gone through three to four minutes of what other people go through every day. Mm -hmm. You know, we have uh, people who have, you know, laid down their lives for the country. We had people fighting on, in, on the side of the military. We had innocent people um, uh, dying with various suicide attacks, this, that, and the other. People caught in the war zone. And we were all, actually, it was amazing to watch this team just talk about things like that rather than saying, okay, oh my God, you know what it is? What about cricket? What are we going to do? Are we going to get through? There's no talk like that. I mean, with eight hours to go before our planes came, Ajahn the Mendes comes in fully bandaged up, uh, arms, head, everything bandaged with his pack of cards and his poker chips and saying, listen, eight, eight hours, we've got to do something. Mm -hmm. um, within a month, we were all back playing cricket, month and a half, even still on, came back after a month and a half from horrific injury. Scored 100, I think, on his, on his back. I think all of these things allowed us to actually understand that, listen, why not us? Mm -hmm. What makes us so special that we can't be attacked or we can't go through something like this? And isn't it our responsibility that if you do, that you get on back with life as best you can?